Some years ago when I was visiting Tanzania, I was traveling with Bishop Zedekiah Kisari, who was the first bishop of the Mennonite churches in Tanzania. And we were talking about Muslims and our relationship with Muslims. And he made the comment, David, never speak critically of the Muslims. He said, when I was ill some years ago and I was in Dar es Salaam, uh, the capital city of Tanzania, he said, next to the hospital where I was was a uh, minaret. And every morning at four o'clock, they would give the call for prayer. So I began to rise from bed and I would kneel by my bed and have prayer and continue till morning when the Muslim prayer call went off, when the Muslim, Muslim prayer call was proclaimed. And he said, I've continued that practice. My prayer life has been transformed, even though I don't hear the Muslims calling for prayer here at Shirati, where I live in central Tanzania, because there aren't many Muslims in that town. Why, uh, I still arise at four o'clock every morning. And he said, I feel indebted to Muslims for the exemplary way in which they get up for early morning prayers. When I began to do that, my ministry was transformed. This regular getting up early for intercessory prayer. Now, he, of course, was not performing salat and so forth but he was involved in intercessory prayer. And uh, I know when I lived in Nairobi, again, right across from the mosque, every morning at four o'clock, I would hear this prayer call. And uh, I confess, I did not arise from bed and go and pray for the next couple hours till daybreak. I would rather stay in my bed and say, oh God, I'm so grateful I'm a Christian. <laughs> I don't need to get up at four o'clock in the morning to pray. I should have, I guess, followed the bishop's example and gotten up and prayed. Um, but all of this is to say that faithful Muslims commit themselves to religious uh, disciplines which uh, are, um, are, uh, are very um, demanding. And uh, I think of uh, Judaism in the time of Paul where he comments how very committed these Jewish people are to their demanding religious obligations. And he writes about this in Romans chapter 10. I would like to just leave that with us this morning as we begin our day of conversations together. Romans chapter 10, beginning at verse 1, Paul writes, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God, and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the end of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. The gift of grace and forgiveness and salvation we have in Jesus is exceedingly precious and uh, frees us from the, from the um, um, I'll say, burden of religious ritual. I use that word advisedly because many of my Muslim friends say these religious rituals we do not consider burdensome. Um, but there is this quest within Islam for acquiring uh, righteousness through these religious rituals. And um, it's very, very similar to the Judaism that Paul participated, Saul participated in as a young man, as a member of the Sanhedrin and so forth. And when Paul met Christ, he met one who brings liberation from that kind of uh, commitment to religious ritual. For he discovered that Christ is our righteousness. And what happened on the cross is that we are given the gift of righteousness. Um, and so we become freed from the obligations to religious ritual. Now, this does not mean that we do not live by faith and that we do not practice the law of Christ, but the law of Christ is freedom from religious ritual, and it is a commitment to loving God and neighbor as Christ loved, and through his spirit, we're empowered to love in that way. As Paul says, oh, so I'm saved by grace, so go and sin boldly. No, 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 no. No, when we're saved by grace, we invite the spirit to bring about his transforming work in our lives that we may live righteously. Um, but it's a freedom from the burden, from the obligations the religious ritual puts upon us. So Paul says, I yearn, I just yearn that this gift of salvation may be experienced by the Jewish people. 
I go to mosques many, many times. And I have wonderful conversations with my Muslim friends and acquaintances and those that are not my friends, just that I meet in the mosque. I think every night after or day after I've had these involvements with Muslims, as I drive home, I say, Lord, I yearn that they may experience the grace revealed in Jesus. For he has a gift to offer that, that is very precious. Now this morning we will continue our discussions uh, related to the gospel and Islam. And remember the overall theme is, um, of, our, of our study is the theme of Islamic and Christian theology and practice, what it means to meet one another theologically and practically. And this morning we begin with topic 11, entitled the Hijra and the Cross. And the chapter, as we mentioned last evening, that we read uh, in terms of this chapter is chapter, this section is chapter 8 in this book, uh, The Way of Christians and Muslims. <clears throat> and I want to work at this uh, theme uh, as narrative today, uh, this theme of the Hijra and the Cross. Um, the, the two narratives, the narrative of Jesus going to the cross and the narrative of Muhammad going to Medina, uh, both significantly form the theologies of both of these communities. And they go in different directions. So we're going to probe that now rather carefully this morning. And I'm going to do it um, um, in, in narrative form, uh, describing an engagement I had in Iran about three years ago, um, Anabaptist Mennonites and Iranian theologians have been involved in a number of dialogues over the last eight years. We are very grateful uh, the Guardian Council has opened the door for this to happen, and they've been very profound and very helpful, I feel, uh, most of them taking place with the theologians at Qum. But along another track, um, I was invited about, about three years ago to participate in a large gathering of Muslim clerics in Tehran. At the, when Ahmadinejad, President Ahmadinejad addressed the group, there must have been 4,000 there, but uh, between 1,500 and 2,000 clerics at this meeting that went on for two days. It was called a Mahdi conference, a Mahdi conference. Now, what's all of that about? Well, it has to do with the Iranian revolution's understanding, Islamic revolution's understanding of their mission in the world and the eschatology which is driving them forward. So it was a great privilege to listen to 21 sermons about all of this and then to be invited to bring a sermon as a Christian within that context. A great honor, very grateful for that. So I want to just share a little bit about the theology that I felt was forming this Iranian revolution, and then what I tried to share within that context. And I'll do this as narrative. The narrative that forms the Iranian Muslim revolution is very much centered in the Hijra. Now, there's other themes as well, but the Hijra is very significant. Let's look at how this Hijra movement forms that revolution, and not just that revolution, but all Muslim communities around the world. But I'm speaking specifically now about that engagement I was invited to participate in in the Iranian context. As we said yesterday, um, when Muhammad began to receive these revelations which he claimed were coming from the angel Gabriel, uh, these powerful revelations, this powerful Quran, which God is entrusting to him and that he is proclaiming, the challenge was that the Meccan people refuse to accept it as a whole. And so he is proclaiming this Quran, but people aren't believing it. And so the question he struggles with is how can this will of God that the, that the Quran is revealing be effectuated in Meccan society and in regions beyond? How can that happen? That's the struggle. Then his wife dies. And so he's in deep grief. And in the context of the death of his wife, uh, there is an event takes place which is called the Miraj. <clears throat> the 
the Miraj. I should have done this earlier. I'll write it right there. The Miraj, which was a horse coming, which a, a horse came from heaven and picked Muhammad up. This is obscurely described in the Quran, but the Hadith fill in of what all happened here. Pick Muhammad up there in Mecca and whisk him all the way to Jerusalem to the Temple Mount, where the Jewish temple had one time stood. You see, it was not there at the time when this happened. This happened 600 years after Christ. There's no temple there anymore. But whisk him to the Temple Mount where the Jewish temple had one time stood. And from there, whisk him up into the seventh heaven. And uh, we say that in Islam, God does not meet us. But in this miraj, apparently, Muhammad comes right into the presence of God. And um, God says, and I don't have all of this quite straight, what all happens there, but uh, the, the, the rough description of, of, the, of the conversation, God says, I want the Muslims to, to, to pray, you know, 50 times a day. And so Muhammad says, okay, that's fine. And so he, he starts coming down to, to the different heavens, and he finds... Moses doing his salats there at one of these heavens. And Moses says, what did God say? God says, 50 times a day, or something like that. Maybe it was 30 times a day, whatever. And what did you say? Well, Muhammad says, sure, we'll do that. And Moses says, are you crazy? I mean, the Jews won't even pray three times a day. You go up there and you tell God it's a bit much. And so for a while, Muhammad shuttles back and forth uh, between uh, the presence of God and Moses to get this negotiated down. And finally, they agree on five times a day. So uh, that's, that's not in the Quran. It's, it's within the Hadith and the religious lore and so forth within Islam. But it's very significant because in that Miraj experience, Muhammad is brought into the presence of God and uh, the decision as to how often Muslims will pray was made in that, in that encounter, in that, in that experience. The horse then comes down, and if you ever go to the, to the Dome of the Rock Mosque there in Jerusalem, it's, it's built over a great rock outcropping, and they will show you an indentation in that rock, which they say is where the horse's hoofs, hoof hit ground when he came down with Muhammad. This horse is called Burak. And from there, he whisked him back to Mecca again. So by dawn, Muhammad was back in Mecca. But this miraj was an enormous encouragement to Muhammad in his prophetic work that although people are not listening very much, there's this affirmation, this miraculous affirmation um, of him uh, being whisked to Jerusalem and on up to the seventh heaven. I'm sharing this as a bit of an aside, um, but just to alert us to one of the reasons why that Temple Mount is so very, very important for Muslims. You know, the Jewish-Muslim conflict over that mount for the Jews, this is where the temple was, uh, was built, you see. It's our rock. <laughs> and for the Muslims, it's our rock. And that's where the Mosque of Omar, and the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Al-Aqsa Mosque is right there. The Al-Aqsa Mosque, Al-Aqsa refers to the farthest Muhammad went in that nighttime pilgrimage, in that miraj. It's the farthest he went from Mecca, you see. Al-Aqsa, the farthest he went. And so these, these, the, the, this, this whole rock there in Jerusalem is just very, very significant in Muslim theology. And uh, it, it contributes significantly to the conflict between Israel and, and, uh, and, and the Muslim world in regards to suzerainty over that, over that rock. It's, um, it's a very, very deep, deep matter. But this gave Muhammad encouragement. Then after that come these messengers from um, Medina. And they say, Muhammad, we want you to come to Medina. And Medina, and Medina is about 400 kilometers north of, um, of Mecca. And in Medina, you will become not only our prophet, but also our statesman. And there's an army. You'll become the general of the army. You will become our political and prophetic leader. We need your help because Medina society was being torn apart with different factions and clan, clan tensions and so forth and we need you, so please come. Muhammad accepts that invitation um, with, um, with deep gratitude. It's, it's as if you combine the miraj with this invitation, 
why um, it's a real affirmation of his prophethood. And so um, he secretly migrates now to Medina. Had he done it publicly, the Meccans would have interfered and he would have never made it. And so he, it, he secretly migrates with his followers, his disciples. Uh, it took about three weeks. During the daytime, they would hide in the desert caves. At nighttime, they would travel. Within three weeks, they had arrived in Medina. I was just with the Muslim friend just recently who told me that, um, um, that uh, actually was with a Christian who, from Muslim background, who was telling me that when he arrived in Medina, it was dancing in the streets as they received him with great, great joy and appreciation, almost like the children singing when Jesus entered Jerusalem um, on, that, on that cult. So in Medina, there was joy filling the city. The prophet has come, the prophet has come. So Muhammad worked at bringing together uh, both those who had immigrated with him and the traditional Medinans. He now had political and military power. And with that power, he was able to establish the rule of Islam throughout Medina and eventually to extend that rule beyond Medina as well. Uh, the wars began then and, um, and um, with, with the Meccans because the Meccan uh, polytheists were not at all happy about what, what was happening in Medina. And so um, for eight years, there were these battles taking place between the Muslims in Medina and the Meccans, and the Muslims won the wars. Um, so finally, there was a peace treaty signed between the Meccans and the Muslims, and Muhammad enters Medina now, um, leading 10,000 troops, many of them on horses. He enters Mecca, with these 10,000 troops. There was no war that day. A peace treaty has already been signed. So he enters in peace. Um, uh, there was one altercation when uh, some women made fun of him and he arranged for them to be dealt with. But other than that, why it was a, it was a completely peaceful entry. And Muhammad declared that today, finally, uh, falsehood has vanished away and truth has triumphed. He goes into the Kaaba and he cleanses it of all of the polytheistic gods in the Kaaba. Remember, we said earlier that there was 360 divinities worshipped in the Kaaba. He smashed them all to pieces and established now only the worship of the one true God, God Almighty, God the creator of the, of the heavens and the earth, the God of Abraham. Only God, Allah, is to be worshipped and all these other idolatrous um, uh, idols and so forth are smashed to pieces. The black stone becomes the center towards which the worshipers bow, remembering that the black stone, they believed, had come from heaven, and it's a sign, they believed, of God's covenant with humankind, covenant with the Muslims, to live in accordance with the will of God. So it's like the sign of covenant. So that remained the center of the worship. Um, but God is the center, and the stone is only a sign of that covenant between God and humankind. And... Um, and he forgave. He forgave the, Medina, the Meccans for what they had done to him. Uh, magnanimously forgave them. There was no reprisals. It was uh, an example of forgiveness and you could say restorative justice as the Meccans now also brought into the, into the Islamic experience. We invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world depends on all of us. We very much need and value your prayer and financial support. For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. It was in Medina that uh, the uh, discussions were taking place between Muhammad and, and the Jews about his prophethood and so forth. The Jews were not accepting that he was a prophet and connected with those discussions as we see it, as we examine what was going on, it seems clear that there was also great debate about Jesus. Remember, Muhammad in the Quran proclaimed that Jesus is the Messiah. And the Jews were saying, well, there, you've got it wrong. <laughs> he wasn't the Messiah. You say you're a prophet of God. How, you can, how can you say that Jesus is the Messiah? We Jews know he wasn't the Messiah because we killed him. We killed him. And if you read the scriptures, the Messiah is going, going to live forever. And so you can't kill the Messiah. So no, that's, that's the, Muhammad, you have it wrong there. And so the rejoinder, which is uh, proclaimed in the Quran, 
is that the Jews have it wrong, you see, that they just thought they slew him, but they slew him not. The Messiah was rescued from the cross. He was not crucified. And so the denial of the crucifixion of Jesus takes place in the context of the triumph of Medina, you see. A theology of the Hijra, in other words, does not have space for a theology of the cross. Because the theology of the cross is suffering at the hands of your enemy, the theology of the Hijra is triumph over the enemy, you see. So um, now I would just say that when I look at the Quran carefully, not just me, uh, the, uh, the scholars look at this, Christian scholars, um, it seems to us there is space within the Quran for the possibility of the crucifixion. For example, the verse that says, they slew him not. They thought they slew him, they slew him not. Well, in some ways, it sounds like John's Gospel, where Jesus says in John's Gospel, you cannot kill me, I'm giving my life. You know, if I want to, I could scoot away. I could send angels to, call the angels to rescue me from the cross. I won't do it. But, uh, you, you, you know, I'm giving my life for the sins of the world. It's not, it's not as if you're taking it from me, you see. That it would seem that comparing that surah in the Quran, they thought they slew him, they slew him not, God just sent an illusion, that there may be some space for considering the possibility of, of the crucifixion. Then there's this verse in the Quran that says, Blessed am I on the day I die and the day I be raised up. Oh, the day I die, the day I be raised up. So maybe, maybe there is space to consider the crucifixion there. Our Muslim friends say Jesus was just taken to heaven bodily. He was never crucified. He did not die on the cross. But the way Muslim theology explains that verse is to say, well, Jesus will come back again at the end of history, and then he will die after he's put everything right, then he will die, and then he'll be raised up. So the resurrection of Jesus awaits the future. That's how they interpret that verse. But I say to my Muslim friends, it seems to me, looking at these different verses in the Quran, uh, such as the one, the day I die, the day I be raised up, that there is space exegetically to consider the possibility of the crucifixion, as well as when you look in the Hadith. There's a friend of mine who recently was invited to a Christian, invited to speak at the Al-Azhar University in, uh, in Cairo, where he, ex ex where he exegeted the Hadith to make a case that there is plenty of space within the Hadith for considering the crucifixion of Jesus. And the rector of Al-Azhar said, uh, thank you for coming, you know. The place was just packed out. We should talk more about this, you see. So I think there's some space exegetically. But... Um, when I share this with my Muslim friends, and you do this, talk with them about that, see how they respond. The response I have always gotten is, maybe, exegetically there's a possibility, but theologically, no. Because truth cannot suffer. The Messiah is anointed with the truth of God. God would never let truth suffer. Remember when Muhammad enters, enters uh, Mecca, leading those 10,000 troops? He says, today, <laughs> truth has triumphed over falsehood. You see, truth <laughs> doesn't suffer. Um, and so, theologically, um, one Muslim told, said, said th this way to me, David, yes, I think exegetically there is space, but theologically never, because the Messiah is anointed with the glory of God and the, um, and the truth of God. And the truth and glory of God can never suffer. Never, you see. And so, the theology of the Hijra takes our Muslim friends in directions which are very, very different from the directions that Jesus invites, which we'll talk about a little later. Now, all of that narrative helps to form the understanding of Islam and its mission in the world by the Iranian Revolution. There's more to it, though. The Iranians are part of the Shia wing of, of, of Islam, which comprises about 10% of the world Muslim movement. And the largest Shia community is in Iran. The Shia believe that after the 12th, see, they believe that the Muslim community should be led by a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad, whom they call the Imam. And they believe that after the 12th Imam, 
or the 12th Imam vanished. And so after, that's about 800 years ago. So since the time of the 12th Imam, they have had no Imam in Iran. But the occultation, the spirit of the 12th Imam prevails. And so the work of the Ayatollahs The ayatollahs, ayat means signs, the signs of God, these men who in their being and personhood through their deep study of the Quran and their spirituality, they get in tune with the occultation, the spirit of the 12th Imam. And so their responsibility is to lead society in ways that reflect the spirit of the 12th Imam. That's what the ayatollahs are about. And that's what the Iranian Islamic revolution is about that the Ayatollahs are leading this revolution, trying to organize the whole of society in a way which is fully in harmony with the spirit of this 12th Imam. And they say he is the Mahdi, the Mahdi. The Mahdi means the savior. Now, both Sunni Muslims and Shia Muslims believe that a Mahdi will come sometime who will be the savior, he, maybe he'll come with Jesus to put everything right, spread Islam throughout the world and so forth. Within Iranian Shia Islam, this theology runs very deep, you see, that the Mahdi will come, and he is the 12th Imam, and he'll come with Jesus. At this big conference we were having on Mahdism, which I referred to a bit ago, in the foyer there was this video clip going on and on, um, get ready, Jesus is coming soon, and the Mahdi with him, you see. What will Jesus and the Mahdi do? Well, the Mahdi will be the leader, and Jesus will be his associate, and their work will be to establish justice and peace throughout the world, and to spread Islam, of course, throughout the world. But the Mahdi and Jesus will work together at that. Now, they believe the Mahdi will come when you have in place a political religious system which is fully in harmony with the thinking of the Mahdi. The reason they think he vanished was because people were not obeying him, were not listening to him. So if the society, led by these righteous ayatollahs, can walk in harmony with his thinking, then he will come. And so all of the Iranian revolution, the theological wing of it anyway, is standing on his tiptoes, as it were, anticipating the imminent return of Jesus and the Mahdi to establish peace and justice throughout the world and to spread uh, Islam throughout the world. That's, that's the vision, that's the hope. And that's what, and even they have the political structure in place so that then the, when, the, when the Mahdi comes, there'll be a position for him because the whole political system is pyramidical, you see. And so the, the pyramid is in place. That's how I understand it. Now, Shia Muslims may, may have additional comments to make and so forth, but as I listen to 21 sermons, there in Tehran, this was my understanding of what this Mahdi movement is all about. Now, it's in that context, I'm invited to preach or to present a 20 minute sermon message. What would you say? What would you say? It was a great honor as a, as a Christian to be invited to address that group. What would you say? So after the break, I will comment on what I said, okay? I told another narrative, as you would imagine. And I thank them for inviting me to come and to share. Yes. Okay, we'll do our break right now. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA, 
Right on the Czech memo line, Russian distance learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300. Or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.